you remember the first game you ever played? Well, okay, maybe not like the first one ever, but like the first one that really stuck with you. The first one that made you feel something in your tiny little child brain, something that was not there before. Something magical feeling, something exciting, something that made you go, oh wow, this whole video game thing, this is, this is something I gotta be here for. I feel like we've all had that one experience that made us love video games. The first one that feels like more than just a game. It becomes something that... <laughs> this is something I can't stop thinking about. Buried within the deepest recesses of my brain lay eternally fond memories of an old NES game called Star Tropics. Now, for me, this was that game. My dad loved Dr. Mario and Tetris, so naturally when I was born there was already one of these guys in the house. The Super Nintendo was already out at this point and the N64 was coming soon, but hey, all I knew was the gray box with the rectangle controller, the gray cartridges, and the bright orange gun. I think I was only three years old when my older sister first started showing me games. Uh, I think the first one I ever played was Mario 3, but we had tons of them. Duck Hunt, Zelda, Ninja Turtles, even the original Final Fantasy, which I would play at like four or five, cluelessly wandering and unable to make any progress because I can't really read all the words yet, but hey, that doesn't matter because I can mash the A button to get past whatever this is, and then I get to move a little guy around, and I get to go to a town and stop by the inn, whatever an inn is, and there's a castle and people all doing their funny little idle animations, and I'm soaking in the wonderful 8-bit world and characters and chiptune compositions. It was magic. But nothing could come close to this one. Like, from the very moment you hit the power button, it already stands out from the bunch. Like, most games you play back then, it's like, here's a logo on nothing, here's a logo on a black screen, or here's a silent demo of some gameplay, but you put in Star Tropics and it's all like... And you let it linger. Sky goes dark. Stars above. Yeah, if you've watched this channel at all, then this definitely looks familiar, because yeah, it's from this. This is the intro to the channel, the, the CRT, the NES, the palm trees, this. This is exactly what was in front of me when video games became something very special to me. This whole game, it felt like such an adventure. In so many ways, NES games just did not often do. And the gameplay, it was so, so unique, so simple, yet, yet deeply nuanced and challenging. Like, coming back and finally beating this thing years and years later, that was one of my favorite experiences I've ever had with a game. This is the guy that started it all, both my deep interest in the wizardry of video games and what I do here on YouTube. This was the first game I ever made like a review type video about. Like I was in my first year of film school and I just wanted to practice editing so I thought I'd try making a, I don't know, YouTuber ass video about it. I talked about how after we got the N64 our NES broke down and my dad pretty much got rid of all the games so anything I played on the NES as a kid more and more with the passage of time became these faint little fuzzy memories of things I couldn't just go back and check. I couldn't just go to the shelf and pick it up and be like, oh, it was Star Tropics. No, it was like, it was like, what was that game? The one with the dolphins and the palm trees and the yo-yo, what was that game? By the time I was 10 years old, it was driving me absolutely bananas. It was like, what was that game I remember loving? I could only read like half of the words back then. I was so young, so I had no idea what the title was. And I tried looking it up on the internet. I tried describing the palm trees, the dolphins, the NES game with this and that. But I guess back in 2002, there just wasn't as much info about this sort of thing online. But if I just knew the title, then I would be able to find it. Then I would be able to remember what it looked like and how it played and everything. But it remained just a faint memory of something that I could only hope to someday, somehow re-experience. Especially because I never even beat it. I would always get stuck on the third chapter. But god damn it, that didn't stop me from popping it in all the time and replaying it over and over and over just to see how far I could get each time. Usually halfway through chapter two. Sometimes I got to see the octopus boss at the end of it, and if I ever got to chapter three, well, it was like hitting a brick wall. Just game over. Like, I don't know, it just... Off. Just confusing, I remember. 
honestly, I'm kind of surprised I never got past it. Like, it was a maze of a dungeon, but I literally had a map of it. Nintendo Power's very own Game Atlas. This thing is full of maps from all the biggest hits on the NES up until that point. Every Mario game, Zelda, Castlevania, even the freaking Ninja Turtles and Chip and Dale. Ooh, this is the first time I ever saw Mega Man. This was the very first time I ever saw the character design, the sprite, the levels, the gigantic characters. Oh, that dragon, look at that. Wait, why does he have a gun? I thought his arm was a gun. Yeah, it is. I was five years old and even I knew whoever drew that did not know what they were doing. And you flip and flip and then you get the Star Tropics. They had maps for the entire game. And this starts with this really nice illustration to segue into it. You know, it's not the most on model and Mike's uncle being up there in the sun is kind of cheesy, but this piece of art also became something that would be stored deep in my mind. It was like the calm part of the journey, between the dungeons and mayhem, just a, just a snippet in time from the adventure. And I would just stare at it all the time. Unfortunately though, the magazines also left with the NES games, so I couldn't even check this to find out what it was called. So, time's still marching forward, the GameCube years passes on by, and now we're entering the Nintendo Wii. Everybody is playing Twilight Princess, Mario Galaxy, Made Christmas Intergalactic, and Smash Brothers Brawl is the hypest thing on the horizon. We're all checking Smash Dojo every single morning to see what's new, like crackhead bees to... Crack! Holy crap, they added Sonic! Now the Wii was exciting. It was something new, sure, Wii Remote stuff, yeah, but it was also the very first time Nintendo was putting old games back up somewhere. And I'm not talking like, they're re-releasing an NES game on the Game Boy Advance. No, I mean, I'm talking an all-out digital storefront packed full with tons of classic games all for just five to ten bucks a pop. That classic bossa nova tune reuniting me with so many of my childhood games. I was 12 now, and Mario 3 was even more amazing than I remembered. I was surprised at how much I kinda didn't like Zelda 1, and how much I loved the brutal challenge of 2, and Final Fantasy had me busting out the old physical charts that we somehow still had. Dude, like, none of this is written in the game. It's actually unplayable if you don't have these charts that came with a cartridge. And I used these, and I beat the whole thing on Wii. But it didn't just stop at stuff I already played. When I realized that I could finally try Mega Man, I was jumping for joy. I can finally play stuff I've never ever tried before. Sign me up Nintendo, here's my email, give me that newsletter. Right in my inbox once a week, I think it was every Wednesday, were the announced additions to the Wii Shop channel and I knew that whatever that palm tree game was, that's gonna show up one of these days. I'm gonna open my email one morning and there it's going to be right in front of me. Not only am I going to finally figure out what it was called, but I'm gonna be able to finally play it again. Oh, I never sprinted faster to the store in my life. I was only 12 years old, but Wii Points cards were only 20 bucks, so I could afford that with my allowance, easy. So I get home, and my family's like stone ages when it comes to internet. We didn't have Wi-Fi yet, so I couldn't get the Wii online. I had to unplug the whole freaking thing and bring it all down to a friend's house just to use the internet there. And we're watching Mario run by the screen, the little uh, loading meter they had when you bought these old games. And we're watching Mario hit the blocks one by one. Oh, he's happy. Halfway. Oh, is he gonna hit the last one? And that would be the first time I ever beat it. I beat a lot of NES games on the Wii back then, and so many of them were really freaking hard. Star Tropics was no exception either. Like, sure, I was older, I could get past that confusing part in Chapter 3, but it was still a brutally challenging game that had me dying over and over, cursing at the TV again and again. And man, that final level, brutal. But I did it, and with every replay, I got better and better until I could zip through it like nothing. And over the years, it would remain one of my favorite video games ever made. This game is still something very special to me, and now on my 10th anniversary of making video game videos, I'm gonna sit down with it one more time. I really, really love this game, so I wanna show you the whole thing. Let's get it going on that old NES ad, get it going with the new NES controller, and I'm gonna show you the ins, the outs, how it all works, the... Right, I forgot we were, uh cutting back on subscriptions, and I guess I could renew it just for this. No, what am I talking about? I'm sick of paying yearly to access games I've already owned for 30 freaking years, so screw it, let's just play it off the old NES for old time's sake. 
you know, the footage isn't gonna look as sharp this way. In fact, it's gonna look like a composite nightmare, but oh well, whatever. Maybe it'll feel like an old AVGN video or something. Look at that real quick, though. Oh, yeah, remember when a box art could just be some nice scenery, and that's it. No no cool guy walking all badass, like, in the middle. No monsters, no items, no nothing. Just somewhere neat that you want to go. Oh, man, like, three perfect screenshots right here. Showing off the big sprites, the cutscenes, the overworld exploration, and the dungeon gameplay. That's pretty much everything this game's got here. Oh, I miss how simple and to the point these back covers used to be. To the point is the last thing I would describe getting the game to work, though. This thing took me 40 minutes to make work. I need a better NES. Actually, you know what? I should probably also get the Wii version going, too, just because I know there are some differences between the two. And, like, I want to show you everything. I want to show you all the little quirks, the differences, every chapter, the characters, the story, and, of course, why the gameplay sticks with me so freaking well. Let's play some Star Tropics. Uh, that was the test file to, like, scale the footage first before I started a new game. Let's go down to Elimination Mode. So this was one of the few NES games that had a save feature, so instead of jumping right in, we first get a classic Zelda-styled menu. You don't even, like, start a new game. You have to register your profile. You can even register multiple at once. It's a, a lot more formal and instructional feeling than, uh, you know, just clicking a new game and that's your file that you get these days. It's very of the era. If you're wondering what review mode is, it just lets you replay the file's current chapter from the beginning without affecting your progress. I never really used it, uh, but that's what the manual says it does. And let's flip to the story. What's the story here? Uh, my name is Michael Jones, but my friends call me Mike. He explains that his uncle Steve, known by most as Dr. Jones or Dr. J, is a famous archaeologist. After receiving a letter from his uncle inviting Mike to an island called Sea Island, he then departs by helicopter, which you can even see if you let the title screen linger long enough. Also says, please read the letter from Dr. Jones appended to this booklet. So yeah, you got the actual letter that he wrote physically in the box too. Like, how's that for going the extra mile? You know what immersion is? It's not photorealistic leaves and dirt. It's this, dude. Now this letter is really cool because firstly, it implies that Dr. Jones didn't like randomly reach out to his nephew that he never met before. No, this is a response to a letter Mike sent him. Mike reached out first and that is just revealed really naturally through the passive writing. It also does a really good job of characterizing Mike. We know from reading the letter that he's 15, he's an honor student, and apparently he plays a pretty mean baseball game. This has got to be one of the most creative creative ways a game's ever set the stage, at least out of anything I've played. Wow, even a signature at the bottom and everything. Wait, what's also at the bottom? Caution, do not taste, eat, or otherwise consume this paper. They then very firmly stress the letter's importance, but we'll get to that later. For now, let's just start the game already. Chapter 1, Prelude. We land at Sea Island. And there's Mike right on the helipad, ready for us to move around. So uh, the game is broken into two different types of gameplay. There are action levels later, but right now we're just doing the overworld stuff. Uh, all you can really do here is walk around, read stuff, talk to people. A button interacts, but that's about it. Welcome to Coral Cola. So we enter the village on the island looking around for Uncle Steve. We talk to the villagers to see if they know where he is. They do know him. He is a local celebrity after all, Mr. Archaeologist. But yeah, uh, what does this lady know? I'm have to hurry. I am going to roast a pig for your welcome party. Ooh, that sounds delicious. Oh, well, there's the pig. Poor little guy. He shows us his little piggy butt. <laughs> That's adorable. This is the Wii version, by the way, and yeah, it's a lot sharper, so I'll be using this for the close-ups. This version is weirdly dark, though. Like, I adjusted the brightness in post just to make it look good, but when you actually play on Wii, like, you're looking at this. I really don't know why NES games appear so dark on the Wii. Anyway, we keep talking to people. Uh, who are you? Stay away from here. Mike, you're an ace pitcher, I hear. Show me how to throw a fastball sometime. I'm Miss Coral, 1990. Do you think I'm pretty? So far, nobody really seems to know where Uncle Steve is, so why don't we try the village chief? He probably will know. I've been waiting for you. I'm Chief Coral Cola and a good friend of your uncle. The mood shifts and the chief gives us some troubling news. Last night, try not to be too upset, but your uncle has been abducted. We must keep this from the islanders so they don't panic. You are the best hope of rescuing Dr. Jones. I don't know what to do, can you help? Nope. <laughs> Whenever you get a choice like this, uh, pressing no always just loops the dialogue over and over until you finally say yes. 
There's a lot of parts of the game where you get an option like this, but it's always fake. You don't really have a choice. Once we agree, we then get our very first weapon, a yo-yo. In the Wii version, and every version onward, they rename the yo-yo the Island Star. I guess because yo-yo is actually a copywritten name. Very dumb, I know. But this really messed with me when I played this on Wii as a teenager. Like, I remembered it being a yo-yo, and I remembered them calling it a yo-yo. So seeing this dude call it a star instead, that gave me like a Mandela Effect moment. The new name does make sense within the world of the game, especially later. But I don't really think the change worked all that well, because, you know, y you can't just tell me that's not a yo-yo. I mean, like, it, it's, it's a it's a freaking yo-yo. We'll have to wait until we're at the first dungeon to use it, but you can view what you have by pressing the select button here. It'll open a little banner showing you what items you got, your health, score. Score doesn't do anything, you can pretty much ignore it. And it'll also show you which chapter you're on. Dude, even just that blew my mind as a kid. It's like, chapter? What do you mean, chapter? Like, normally you got level one or world one, but like, back then, this saying chapter? It's like, oh, this is a story. And, and that makes sense, because so far everybody's talking to you, you got these giant character sprites just to convey dialogue, and dialogue is more than just instructions or, or like a hint or something, right? This wasn't gonna be your typical Zelda type of adventure, no. This is gonna be something a little bit different. What you mean? We talked to the village chief, but Buddy Bingo over here still won't let us pass. Okay, so a lot of people think that you have to talk to every single villager before he lets you through, but I've done this without necessarily talking to everyone. I, I think it is just select villagers. Well, I didn't talk to Granny here. Where are you from? Americola? <laughs> That's pretty funny, actually. Let's try Buddy Bingo again. Now he knows who we are. Now he lets us through. That's all it took was talking to Granny. Oh no, now I'm curious. Now I have a morbid curiosity. I just have to do this. Okay, so on my Wii playthrough, I poked at the dialogue in a different order and kept resetting over and over until I determined precisely who does and who does not need to be spoken to. You have to talk to the greeting guy, the little girl who talks about Dr. J, the blue guy who talks about shooting stars, the boy who knows your uncle, the boy who talks about Mike being an ace pitcher, and of course, Granny Americola. Uh, which makes sense because that one is a running gag. They probably wanted you to see the first one before seeing the others. You don't have to talk to the other greeting guy, the roast pig lady, the pig itself, chief is waiting lady, the fishing kid, and Miss Coral, which I'm, I'm really surprised because that is also a running gag. But yeah, I guess the idea here is that the guard doesn't know who Mike is until you get to know the village in general. You talk around, you get to get known, and then the guy is like, oh, it's you, the guy I do know now. But I'm sure what's really happening is they just want to make sure most of the important story stuff and the characterization they wrote all actually got read by the player. And honestly, you should probably just read it all anyway, because this game's writing, it is so delightfully silly. As we enter the first dungeon, we're met with the village chief's sister, a shaman warning us of the perils ahead. But have no fear, with the magic of the Southern Cross on our side, we will pass the test of violent courage and save Dr. J. Now a little fun fact for you: not only is this a real constellation, but it's actually one that has a lot of cultural significance all around the world. In fact, it even appears on many flags throughout history, so they're definitely borrowing a little bit of inspiration from real life with this. Here it's depicted as the Islander version of the North Star, guiding sailors safely through the tropics, but it's also said to have mystic powers, aiding those in a time of need. I always loved how it says refrain from pressing power. There's something wonderful about playing games from a time before we had like a, I don't know, like a standardized language to describe all video game concepts. So you're just looking at like however they just happen to word it. And here we go, the real meat of Star Tropics, the action stages. So yeah, like the controls are gonna feel really weird to most people at first, I'm sure. You walk on a tile-based grid, and when you press the D-pad, like that's not gonna make Mike move that way. Tapping the D-pad only makes Mike face that direction. In order to actually move that way, you gotta hold it down a little longer. And he's not gonna stop on a dime when you let go of that thing either. He's gonna keep moving until he's fully on that next tile. So you're kind of like moving square to square with like a little transition in between. It's a very pause and go feel. Most games you just go, you know, the moment you hit that direction they're moving, you're going, but here you can rotate the d-pad to rotate Mike. He'll face that direction without moving. He doesn't walk until the press has been held for about 10 frames or about one-sixth of a second. It is unconventional, that's for sure, but not without its reasons. This way you can easily aim the yo-yo without walking into every enemy you're trying to hit. And in fact, once Mike is dedicated to moving 
moving to another tile, you no longer need to hold that direction. Now you can have them attack in a different direction while moving, even if the window is very brief. It feels a lot less like you're walking and more like you're shifting your weight between each tile movement. If you want to keep the pace up, you gotta shift your weight before Mike is fully on the next tile, leaning into that direction preemptively so when Mike is able to make another movement, he will move in the direction you're already holding. It's sort of like riding a skateboard in that you always have to be anticipating your next move slightly early. So the B button attacks, of course, but you also have a jump on the A button. Now, normally he'll just jump in place. Even if you're between the tiles, he's gonna go up instantly. This way, you can dodge anything coming at you, from enemies charging in your direction to projectiles of all shapes and sizes. Now, if you jump while moving into one of these green squares here, you'll then get this little magnetic hop. Mike will gravitate over to that tile and land safely. These tiles can't be walked to or walked off of. You gotta hop between them all. Which is kind of fun, you're bouncing all around the place, and uh, you can even jump over water too. As long as it's one space though, not two. If it's two, you're gonna fall in and die. Sometimes you'll even find a hidden switch too, so you're always gonna be hopping all around these tiles trying to find secrets or, or maybe extra items, or perhaps you're simply opening a door. But regardless, this is how you look for mechanisms, feeling around for those tiles and looking for a secret one. And the sound effect is so satisfying every time, it never gets old. Oh, that's so good. So, this jump, I can very much see this thing uh, feeling really weird to most people that are used to jumps acting in one consistent way. But honestly, this is like less of a jump and more of a contextual action. Normally, it's a dodge in place kind of move, but when dealing with certain tiles, it's now used for mobility. In fact, if you get the timing right, you can even dodge while moving tiles. Even retaliate during the hop. Hey, remember how you can do this while walking between the two tiles? But a jump, that's further. That's more tile transition time to turn and attack. Most enemies also cannot move through the water, so hopping across these tiles, you can use that water as a shield, whacking at them from a safe distance. It is also methodical, so careful and strategic. You're always considering both offense and defense, taking on every monster and obstacle with a checkerboard dance where every action requires commitment and anticipation. It's all unconventional as hell, and even perhaps by many standards, completely unwieldy, but hey, as a fan of games that reel your capability back in order to create a challenging back and forth, this is amazingly fun to me. No matter how many times I replay this game, I always have a freaking blast. Like again, the controls, yeah, they take getting used to, sure, but you can get good at this. You can absolutely get really good at this. Everything you need is here, and it is incredibly satisfying once you do get the hang of it. Like I tell you, that learning curve, it's totally worth the patience because developing that muscle memory, like once you have it, you can then do some pretty dang cool stuff with it. I always saw a lot of people compare this all to Zelda. Reviewers back in the day would always draw the comparison, but I really think they were getting a little bit too caught up in the, some of the visual elements being similar, menus, enemies, even the health meter, but the gameplay is so much of its own thing. Like, I don't know any other game that, that quite feels like this at all. Like, Zelda sure as hell don't. And they really do get the most out of this gameplay style because you got so many different enemies and items that all bring something totally different to the table. You got your slow-moving slugs, you got your speedier rats that have more health, the diagonal movement of the bats, starting and stopping so they don't become too overwhelming, and the snakes that'll dart at you the moment they see you. Either lure them out and hit them from the side, or jump over them and get them in the back. I remember looking at all the illustrations of these enemies in the manual. Man, and I would see so many ridiculous monsters that I never got to fight. I love these big enemies, very slow, but they hurt if they hit you. A lot of health too, so you're really peeling out and striking back. It's super fun trying to control the traffic, jumping over tiles, scooting around as you pepper out those strikes. Oh, and the way every blow you land stops them for just a second. Like it really feels like you're hammering them back and slowing them down. Not only is it satisfying as hell, but it also makes the scramble all the more strategic. Tile hoppers are a frequent occurrence. Usually these cute little octopus guys, you gotta use those tiles, so clear them out and make the path safe. This is where attacking during the jump really comes in handy. Hitting them with that tricky dicky bullshit, like, that's the good stuff. Some enemies will try to catch you off guard by popping out of the water. You'll have to either dodge real quick or hammer at them to take them out before they hit you. Some guys will pop out and launch a projectile, giving you something to jump over as you make your way through. The handling enemies at the same time, it gets especially challenging. 
Taking on enemies with just the yo-yo can be tough sometimes, so you'll always want to keep an eye out for any extra weapons you can find. They're temporary, always come with limited ammo, but they're often more powerful than the yo-yo, so they can be extremely helpful, especially during boss fights. The only one you'll find in this first dungeon is a torch. Short range, not super great, but later on you'll get slingshots, bola twisters, ninja stars, and baseball bats? Yeah, the bats run out of ammo too. <laughs> I don't know. Not only do all these weapons offer more damage, but I also love how different they all feel. The bola twisters go across the whole screen, so they're great for keeping a safe distance, but the baseball bat does basically the opposite. It's a short range spin move, so that's great for when there's a lot of guys close around you. The ninja stars are especially cool. You throw them and press the button again to separate. You can take out multiple enemies at once, or maybe just get in some sneaky hits around a corner. You can even activate traps from a safe spot and then dodge them more easily. Now that's strategy. Uh, much later on, we have these magic mirrors that you can reflect stuff back. Uh, these enemies are normally invincible to your weapon, so you gotta time the move just right and give them a taste of their own medicine. And if you want some real power, you can find the spike shoes. Basically a screen clear move. Mike super kicks everything in the face! Super OP, but you're not gonna see these very often. That's what we have for weapon stuff, but there's also items that can only be used from the pause menu. These special items. Oh, I love how he turns into little overworld Mike holding up the pause sign. So many games would just not do that. So many games are just like, yep, it's pause. Oh yeah, yeah, pause. But no, here they did a little cute thing with it. You gotta love that. But uh, yeah, while you're paused, just press down on D-pad to access all your items. You got magic rods to unveil the invisible, snowmen to freeze all the enemies on screen, you got lanterns to temporarily illuminate any dark rooms, and of course, any potions you've got for a quick heal in any moment. These potions are probably the most consistently helpful of all the items. It is a tough-ass game after all, so you'll be on the hunt for these all the time. So bop those buttons, find those secret spots, and grab those potions. Oh, and what's that? Another secret! We got a secret within a secret! That's Secret Palooza! New exit, go on through here. And right there, another red potion. Wicked cool. I may as well try hopping on these tiles, and oh, another one! See, it helps to be curious and poke around no matter where you're at. Hey, don't mind if I do. Ooh, the beginner's trap. This scared the crap out of me as a kid. I mean, kind of morbid, the skulls and everything there. It's like, oh, we're not the first person to fall for this. Now, this is kind of infamous. Some people think it's kind of cheap. I wouldn't really argue that because realistically, it's level one. It's not like you need every single life and you're really just going to lose like, what, a minute of progress, even if you have to restart the whole dungeon over. So it's really just this cute little silly thing just to catch you off guard. Though... I do think the game does get a little mean with this sort of thing sometimes. This one's just iconic, you know, it's fine because of the context surrounding it. But later on, there's parts where you'll just like die from leaving the wrong side of the room and you have no way of knowing what was up there before you jumped. Yeah, put the hearts over on this side, so I go over to this side, you jerk. This laid into the level too, like that's just mean. That's later on though, right now we're finishing up the first level with a snake boss. Ooh, pretty simple, just move to the side when it's attacked and land in the middle when it's safe to unload. Though you'll only deal damage when the mouth is open, so you really have to get the timing right. Once it's beat, it freaks the hell out and explodes! I love how the bosses do this, and when you go to the next screen, the skeleton. Now come on, now that's just badass. Wow, you've done it! The game gives you a whole bunch of points after every dungeon, which is pointless. Ha! I don't know why they do this. I don't think they did either. A lot of games back then just had score for the sake of score. A Mega Man 1 did, and they got rid of it and all the others because they were like, yeah, there's no point in this. We come around to the lab and we meet with Dr. J's assistant, Babu. He tells us about Uncle J's submarine, sub C, even giving us the code we need to use it. Well, all right. I wish I could tell you more, but I'm afraid of... of... And he just moves. Ooh, that's kind of spooky. Well, at least it was for the time. It was like, whoa, 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 what was he talking about? What, what can't you tell me, Babu? We head down to the lab and board subsea. You get some pretty wild full screen sprite art here. Look how cute this little guy is. Fashioned after Rob, of course, this is Navcom, our little robot assistant that helps us sail the tropics. Mike gives Navcom the code and we're all set to sail off out into the sea. Every chapter always ends with this nice little bit of you sailing off. And that's chapter two, dolphins. Right away, we're approached by a mother dolphin who explains that her son has gone missing. We agree to find the baby dolphin as we arrive at a brand new island. 
Not much to do on this side of it. Uh, there is a lighthouse, you can go in there, but there's not much to do. Just a lighthouse keeper, just has some flavor text. Where else can we go here? So this is where manning that sub gets a little interesting. You gotta slip through these little passages, subtly telegraphed by the water flow. We also learn of hidden overworld caves. This one's easy, marked by the dirt, but you can find all sorts of these just by trying to move into rocks and walls and stuff. Sometimes it's optional, maybe you'll find an extra heart container making your health bar a little bigger, but other times it's man mandatory, like here, where we find a message in a bottle. It's from Uncle Steve, and here's the plot twist. He was abducted by aliens! Yeah, now you know why it's Star Tropics, like Star Trek, but the tropics, I don't know, it's something like that. Tropics meets the stars, whether it's the Southern Cross or aliens, you know, you get the picture. Tell my nephew to use code 1776. We go back to the sub, tell Navcom the code, and we unlock the ability to submerge. Oh, well, yeah, it's a submarine. Now we can press the B button to dive underwater. This allows us to traverse deep water. Just sink on one of these tiles here and you'll be brought somewhere new. Over here we find the next dungeon, and immediately this one feels very different from the first one. Lots of water and long stretches of land. You got these little blubberfish guys charging at you. Hop over them or quickly take them out. A lot of tile hop in here. You'll find those little octopus guys for the first time, and the baseball bat as well. You really get a lot of cool moments to use this thing. Swatting at the snakes from a diagonal is really handy and oh right here if you're fast enough oh nice and oh what's that right there yeah so here we are also introduced to tunnels in dungeons certain walls will allow you to pass through often labeled with a patch of dirt but not always it's all about finding those secrets so yeah this dungeon's a little trickier a little tougher too but you know it's level two so it's still pretty easy and there he is the baby dolphin poor little guy's trapped in a hole if we want to free him, we'll have to take on the octopus. Very basic boss. Yeah, a lot easier than the snake, actually. Dodge the bullets, jump in side to side, and wait for him to come down and pack his lunch with punches. If you have the snowman doll, you can freeze him in place, making the fight even easier. This was my favorite boss as a kid because it was one of the two bosses I actually got the fight, and he looks really cool. And he, and, it's, and it's pretty easy. The kids like easy. We explode the big octo, we free the little guy, and the mother dolphin then shows us the way to the next chapter. Oh no, chapter three, storm and calm. Mike's been shipwrecked. Or I guess subwrecked would be more accurate, but yeah, uh, time to look around and find something that can fix our boat. We've got a little hut here, just a guy giving us coconut milk, which helps, but doesn't fix our boat situation, so let's keep looking. And we've got a dungeon already, so this is a pretty basic one, mostly just combat with some uh, harder enemies than we've seen before. These little parrots are similar to the rats, very sporadic chasing movement, except obviously they're harder. They got winged monkeys, this game just has the most random enemies. Uh, these guys will hop all around, including over water tiles, but you can take them out from a distance with the bola twisters for an easier time. I like these. These guys, these are some of my favorite. Like, what are they supposed to be? Skeleton ostriches? The skull birds? This is like a FromSoft enemy. Like, this is literally the kind of weirdo monster design you'd fight, like, in, in Dark Souls or something. They are tough and they hop water, but you can use the moment that they ready their jump to your advantage. Get them to chase you in a circle and then slam at them every time they pause. Easy breezy. This dungeon also introduces these platforms that'll sink in timed intervals. Not too hard to get the timing right, but I do find it a lot easier with the Wii for some reason. Maybe I'm just getting input lag off the NES, that's that's probably it. Hit the side buttons for some extra hearts. Uh, there's a harder version of this later where you have to make the heart spawn first and then grab the stopwatch to stop the tiles. If you don't do it in that order, you're totally gonna die trying to get those. I mean, don't forget this game is full of traps, right? This game will try to bait you into dying with items, so don't fall for it. Ow. This dungeon is also where we start to see two pretty annoying mechanics, false exits and dark rooms. Uh, let's start with the dark room. So you walk in, everything quickly goes dark. Hope you remembered where the tiles were because you can't see nothing anymore. You can walk around safely since you can't fall off by walking, you have to jump. So it is possible to feel around for land depending on the situation. But your best bet is just to be ready to remember where the tiles are because that's how you turn the lights back on, finding the right switch. Now what makes this room a double whammy for teaching game mechanics is that if you leave the room the easier way, which you're probably going to the first time you go through this dungeon, you're then met with a set of stairs. And if you take those stairs, 
you're kicked out of the dungeon. A little annoying, yeah, but hey, I'm glad they let you learn this by just letting the player make a mistake themselves instead of having a pop-up telling you how to respond to everything in front of you. This way you feel the weight of landing in that trap. You do not want to do it again. But they also made sure to teach you this in a mini dungeon, so you don't have to lose like that much progress before it really becomes a problem later. It's that classic Nintendo show don't tell. Though I admit it is a slightly more patience testing version of it. We finish up the dungeon and we come out and wow, look at that mountain. You get a pretty cool view of that on the way to the village. Welcome to Miracola. Where do you come from, Americola? Oh yeah, that one again. Who are you? Stay away from here. Oh, another case of talk to the villagers. All right, well, I'm not gonna test this one. I'm just gonna talk to everybody. This, this village is too big. Hi, I'm a brave sailor too. Can I go with you? You almost died at sea? Um, uh, um, hmm. Uh, I'm getting seasick. I, I better stay here. I'm Miss Mira, 1990. You met Miss Coral? Yeah, we did. Who's better? Oh no, why are you asking me that? If you pick Miss Coral, she gets mad at you, but if you pick her, she says you're honest and cute. <laughs> I talked to everybody else, and now it's time for the Chief's Hut. I'm just hanging out. He's the Chief. <laughs> the dude's just chilling in here. Bam, bam, bam. The chief explains that his daughter has fallen asleep and won't wake up. A curse. Wait, her name's Banana? <laughs> they were naming her daughter. They looked around and saw Banana. It's like, that's her name, Banana. <laughs> he explains that there's a mountain hermit that might be able to help. Help his daughter, and he'll fix our ship. Well, before heading out, we have to pay his daughter a visit, which uh, you can see the back entrance from in here. That's a very cool unveil. Otherwise, you have no idea you can go in here. Pretty underwhelming visit. She's asleep. Yeah, that's it. So let's head out. This next dungeon does some pretty cool stuff with the dark rooms. You have to rely on the enemy movements to determine where the footing is. And by now, you know how each enemy behaves, so it's pretty easy to put two and two together. It's really cool. And what do we have here? That looks peculiar, doesn't it? Like, why have that opening? Why have that tile there? Yeah, buddy, another secret. Now, this game's chock full of them. And here's that room with that really unfair trap. If you go up to the left, you just die. Don't do that. <laughs> and just beyond here, we have the boss. A pretty cool one at that, too. Like, he's this big fire guy, and, and attacking him does nothing. He's invincible. So you have to instead hop around and look for these two switches. Bop both buttons, and the platform underneath him breaks, plunging him into the water. Take that, magma man. We take our leave back to the overworld, and we discover the castle of She-Cola. No boys allowed. We circle around to the back of the castle, and there's a fortune teller there. She'll help us if we can bring back her crystal ball. Wait, you dropped it where? Oh, okay, off to the ghost village. I love how it's represented by just a house, but there's no village, there's no house, there's no, there's nothing inside at all. It's just a graveyard with a pond. Why even call it a haunted village? Why not just call it a haunted graveyard? That house ain't fooling me, no one lives here. Enter the blue tombstone, and we're at the dungeon that always roadblocked my childhood playthroughs. Not only do the enemies get a lot tougher and a lot faster, but there are false exits all over the place. Walk into the wrong room? Too bad, holy way out is out of the dungeon entirely. Oh, what's in this one? A way forward? Nope, back to start. Fantastic. Getting through here requires a combination of cunning and a lot of trial and error. It's a cool puzzly dungeon, but it, yeah, it definitely requires a lot of patience. So what are we looking at here? Uh, the dark rooms are used in a very cool way in this dungeon too. Now you have lanterns, which will light them up, but only for a short while. So combined with those sinking tiles you have to time in, also those like little tunnels you have to go through the walls, you're now bouncing back and forth between getting a good look and getting as far as you can based on your memory. Even maybe timing the jumps based on the sound effects if you're brave enough and you want to try saving another lantern. Invisible enemies are also something you'll deal with here. You'll have to find these magic rods to unveil them, which is a big part of getting through this dungeon. Many screens will require taking out all of the hidden ghost enemies in order to open the way that you're supposed to go. Even rooms that seemingly have nothing to do other than like go the one obvious way. Get a little crafty, use that rod, find a secret enemy, open a secret way, and go there. And that's what it's all about here, is finding as many secret pathways as possible while ignoring the obvious ways. Obvious means out, but secret means success. They're going all out with the secrets in this dungeon. It's the first level that is really tough, but it's a blast once you know what you're doing and we're not to go and everything, but you know, to be fair, I'm never gonna forget that first annoying ass time when I got through this on Wii as a teen. So yeah, this is basically the turning point. If you have the patience for this dungeon, yeah, hell yeah, you're gonna love the rest of this game. 
But if not, you find it just frustrating, then okay, sure. You know, you got a little bit in. You got to experience a bit of Star Tropics. Hey, cool, right on. But this is where you're going to want to drop it if it hasn't clicked yet. This dungeon is the Rorschach test. This is when you find out whether or not this game is for you. But that's also a big part of why replaying this as a teen felt so freaking magical, because getting back to this chapter, and then it does click. It's like, oh wow, this game is for me in this way, and now I get to see the rest, and the rest is cool as shit. I mean, the boss fight just coming up, for instance. Like, look at this. You come into this room and there's nothing going on. So you think, oh, what if I use the rod? Maybe there's another secret ghost. Oh, the entire boss fight's a secret freaking ghost. Not too hard. Just uh, dodge and fire those bola twisters back and he's cooked. We head out into the drainage canal. Oh, damn. That's wicked sick. Look at that. That's cool as shit. Drain the pond, grab the crystal ball, and the fortune teller helps us by... Dressed us up like a girl. Now we can get into Shikola. We meet the queen, and impressed with our ghost fighting warrior skills, she grants us a brand new weapon the Shooting Star. Yeah, so now you know why they called it the Star on Wii, because the upgraded one is the Shooting Star. It's like, it doesn't really make sense backwards, though. In the manual, it's depicted as a spiked ball and chain, so I guess that's, I guess that's what it is. It's kind of metal, actually. Like, going to this from a yo-yo, like, that's badass. On the way out, one of these warrior ladies tells us how to get to the next dungeon. Gotta jump on that switch ten times and shout, Abracadabra! So, uh, that's technically the reason why you can't do this early, because Mike doesn't know to shout that. You don't hear him shout that, but, you know, it's one of those little, I guess it's a cute reason why you can't skip the dungeon. Here we basically have a mini dungeon just to get across how the new weapon works and right away you get some hearts to show you that you only have it when you have enough health and then we're tackling some familiar enemies but this time we're hitting harder and further and now it's a cinch. You really do feel more powerful. After that we have one more dungeon. This is the most dungeons per chapter 4 in chapter 3 but yeah a pretty basic for the most part just a lot of combat though they do introduce tiles that quickly sink after you land on them. Not the hardest thing in the world to deal with but they can be a little annoying sometimes. Just gotta be quick on your feet. Again, I had an easier time on Wii. I think I really do just have a little bit of input to lay on my NES. Towards the end here, there's this really tricky part. You go from room to room to room, basically in a big square around this central room that you're trying to access from the correct side. We want to get to that geyser, but how do we get there over there? After finding no discernible way to get in from the right, that's when we start hugging the wall for secret passages, and voila! All these secrets all the time, man. You really feel like a teenager Indiana Jones. The geyser takes us up the mountain to the hermit, and he gives us the scroll of Obob, which we then bring to Banana, read it, and that brings her back to the waking world. Wow, it's a miracola. I'm hungry, is dessert ready? Banana, put down that banana cream pie. Mike will never forget your kindness. To pay us back, the chief has our sub fully repaired, and we can set out into the ocean once more into a new chapter. Chapter 4, we arrive at Tunacola, a big fish-shaped island, and at the village we hear about somebody drifting out on a raft out to the east. We sail out in that direction, and holy moby sweaty dick, that's a whale! We enter the belly of the beast. Inside the whale, we find Babu again. He explains that he witnessed Dr. J getting abducted. He also hatches a plan to get out of this thing, find his lighter, start a fire, and make it sneeze. This chapter's a big maze, a lot of dead ends. You'll find a lot of dead ends, a lot of turning around or dunking in the wrong spot and ending up back where you started. A little bit annoying, but I guess even if you waste, like, maximum amount of time, you're really still getting through here in, like, ten minutes. With enough determination, we get through, find the lighter, set a blaze to Babu's raft, and, uh... Oh, it's getting smokier. It's getting smokier. As these two idiots engulf themselves in smoke, the whale sneezes them out. I promise to never smoke again. Okay, here we go. Dr. J's last words. Evil aliens from a distant planet. Tell Mike to dip my letter in water. They're not talking about anything in the game. They're talking about that actual letter, the one that we got with the game. Yeah, so this is one of the most well-known things about this game. The whole fourth wall break in this chapter. You had to actually dip this letter in real water to unveil a secret code. Now, I never actually had this as a kid. I mean, I never even got far enough to need it, but I always knew about it. It was the one part of the experience that I did not get when I finally played the Wii version. So I figured, hey, just for this video, I want to do this. I want to do this for the very first time. I want to experience this like the actual way that like you would back in the 80s. Dude, I have always wanted to do this like my whole freaking life. And I didn't when I bought this because I knew 
should probably wait until I make this video. So let's do it. Let's figure out that code the intended way. Just to avoid damaging the paper as much as I can, I figured I'd lay it down flat and pour water over top of it. Oh, and there it freaking is. Wow! A secret message that was here for us the entire time. I've set it there to dry. Uh, Mike, I found some strange ciphers in my last voyage. Since then, someone's been watching me. I put a tiny transmitter in my shoe. Its frequency is 747 megahertz. Perhaps I worry too much, but better to be safe than sorry. Sincerely, Uncle Steve. I wonder what would happen if you let this dry, so I filmed the time lapse of it drying, and the ink disappears like it was never there to begin with. Whew, Uncle Steve knows how to cover his tracks. We tell Navcom the code, type in 747, and now we have Dr. J's precise coordinates. And we follow them on into the next chapter. Now, believe it or not, I did not have to look this up on the internet when I finally played this on Wii. No, no, like, they included this in the digital manual. On the story tab, you click right here, and oh, it's a letter. Scroll on down, you click this little thingy, and... Boom, there it is. You really have to appreciate that, man. I mean, like, they could have just wrote it down somewhere in this manual, or they could have, like, reprogrammed it to skip this part entirely. They did change some stuff about the Wii version as it was, after all, but but no, they made this, like, cool little interactive way to find it. It's like they knew that was part of the experience, so they, they actually tried to preserve that in some way. Speaking of the Wii manual, I wish they fully scanned the original, because it's full of these sketches and illustrations. I used to look at these all the time as a kid. It's a shame it didn't include them. Instead, the Wii manual was kind of built from scratch, and to its credit, it really does go over everything. Still an effort far beyond what you'd expect from Nintendo these days. I mean, with the NES Classic and Nintendo Switch Online re-releases of this game, they forgot about this entirely. There's no mention of the code anywhere on the app or in the description or anything. You have to look it up if you're playing this version. You cannot make progress otherwise. Come on, guys. Like, it's one thing if you're playing on an emulator or an unofficial version, and yeah, you gotta look it up. But the current official version doesn't have a way around this? That is just terrible design. That is terrible preservation of your own products. Do a better job. You're Nintendo for crying out loud. Eh, this was sort of a problem back then too, I guess. I mean, if you rented the game or you lost the insert, you would be out of luck. Internet wasn't gonna help you back in the 80s, so the best you could do was just hope you had the right issue of Nintendo Power. Oh, I even remember having the Star Tropics specific issue. Yeah, with the parrot on the cover, that was so cool looking. I, I wish I still had this. Anyway, Chapter 5. We're following Dr. J's coordinates, and suddenly the straight ahead is blocked by a giant ship. Well, who put that there? Well, let's dock the submarine, enter the local village, and see if anybody knows. And here we are in Belcola. We see the chief, and he explains the history of their island. Captain Bell defended the village from pirates and blocked the strait with his ship to prevent them from going through. So if we want to get past, we gotta find the secret to moving the boat in Captain Bell's cave. Which is a secret cave we gotta find with more secrets. This game, so many secrets. It's the most adventure game puzzle overworld segment in the whole game. It's pretty neat. Uh, you can dunk over here to find a hidden part of the island. A fisherman here gives you a worm. Through these hidden tunnels in the mountains, you then find Captain Bell's memorial. A building with this gigantic organ. Do You can't do anything here yet, but if we double back to the main part of the island, we find a parrot named Peter. Feed him the worm, and he shares us a riddle. Good morning, Captain Bell. Good morning, Captain Bell. Hide, Peter, hide. Ock, do me so far, do me. Hide, Peter, hide. Ock, do me so far, do me. What the shit are you talking about? Sounds like a whole bunch of wagabahoo to me, but think about it. Parrots just repeat the stuff they hear, so what if this was the last thing he heard Captain Bell say? Do. The rest of the keys are unlabeled, but we know. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Do me so far. Do me. Do me so far. It's a song! Captain Bell was telling him the song that opens the cave. We play the tune on that big ass organ, and there it is. We gain access to the next dungeon. Oh no, this is the one that's either gonna be one of your favorites, or least favorites. There's death traps everywhere. Here's a room that falls apart. Don't bother with the two extra hearts. I swear, it's actually impossible to get them. Grab the one, move on, and it's a flurry of spears. Oh. Ah. Oh. Fuck. These things are pretty cool. You hit them to get them going, and then you jump over. They have this really cool room here with a whole bunch of these. You have to get two going at once to uh, go through a different way. And then you go that way and you come back, and from the new angle, then you can activate two different ones and go a different way. 
I did not understand that at all the first time I played this. I just kind of brute forced through it. I was gonna recreate it here, but I accidentally dodged both of them. But I just kind of basically went straight through it this way. You're not supposed to do that. I don't know what is up with this part, but you sink down into this this hell pit with these... Like, what is happening? Are those logs? What are they stabbing up to the ground? Who's doing that? Why are they hurtling towards me violently? What is happening? And the music changed too. Like, it's all so sudden. It's so sudden. Like, just because you stepped on the wrong square, you get absolutely... There's four staircases here. Each one brings you to a different corner of the above room, so you're basically falling down over and over until you pick the right one. It's a very zany and chaotic room, and honestly, it's one of my favorites in the game. Can't say I love the boulders, though. If they hit you, you're pretty much dead, so you really gotta be careful. You can stop them temporarily by whacking them, so you better keep that shooting star, unless you want to deal with the danger of getting that close. Similar to before, we enter a bit of a loop, until you realize you should probably start using those rods this room keeps giving you. Find the right room, smash that ghost, and unveil a secret exit. Before long, we find this uh, pump device, I think. We activate it, and hey, the ship's sinking. The strait is blocked no longer, and we sail out yet again. Chapter 6. This one, you're sailing around looking for those coordinates. You can dock at several islands looking for hearts if you want. Uh, there's also a little village with some dudes you can talk to. Welcome to How Do You Do Cola. Well, how do you do? <laughs> Each hut here houses one of the oldest people in all the islands. 177, third oldest. 199, that one's the oldest. And second oldest is 188. Hmm? You said you've already met the second oldest. You must have bananas in your ears. Wait, yeah, that did happen back in Belcola. Why did why did she lie to us? Not all too much to do on these islands here. You'll mostly be going through the ocean and dunking through a lot of water, looking for the way forward. It's actually a pretty fun maze. Not as tedious as the whale, that's for sure. We soon find the right spot near this, uh, whoa, is that a crater? Dunk down, and it's this underwater ruins. We enter a dungeon. It's actually just a transition screen to set the mood. Just go forward, and we're back out, and whoa, check out those pillars, those statues. Where are we? Okay, dungeon for real this time. Uh, we got plenty of tough, meaty enemies to take on with our shooting star. Oh, it's called a shooting star because it's like a morning star. I just realized that. Anyway, uh, who are also granted the long jump for the first time. Grab that feather and Mike will turn orange. Now we can hop over two tiles, at least until we leave this screen. You even get a new sound effect to make it feel more distinguished from the regular jump. That's some good game feel right there. This is wicked cool. Like, it totally changes how you think about navigating those tiles. Looking for these chess-like movements of one or two spaces. And it's even easier to pop off those mid-jump shots with all that extra air time. Now that is fun as hell. Here's a fun room, all the mummies going around. So the idea here is to hit the button and then take them all out from the center where you're safe. But I got my muscles wrapped around this thing well enough that I don't really need to do that anymore. I just run around with them and hit them. It's more fun and challenging to me that way. Now, how do you get to that tile there? There. Yeah, leap of faith. Hey, bet some of you didn't know that one. Potion for the fight. And here we have a midway boss, a giant seashell blasting green Cheerios at us. It's very similar to the octopus fight. Uh, similarly easy, too. You just keep dodging, wait for it to come down, and lay the smack down. And here we have another interesting dark room. Only one pathway here is marked, but based on your observations, well, you must be able to. Yeah, 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 you can go through here, too. Grab that long jump, and now we can do all sorts of stuff in here. This room's cool. It is the only room in the game, at least I think, where it's all just tiles, and you got all these mummies to fight. So you better get hopping, and you better get striking. And before too long, we're at the boss. A big floating Moai head. <laughs> Every now and then it opens its mouth and comes out a snake. Jump over it, Mike. I think you can only hurt it with the baseballs. I'm not even sure if I mentioned the baseballs. It's another weapon. You just kind of throw it. It's okay. Uh, but yeah, make sure you save the baseballs for this fight. I'm pretty sure you need them. I love how cracked out he looks when you beat him. Like, he's like, oh no! Ah! We exit out into uh, another maze. Star Tropics sure loves mazes. This one's kind of annoying. But man, is it worth it. When you come out and you see this thing, it's like, what? what is that? Whoa! Looks melted by a great heat. I'm willing to bet whatever this is, this is what left that crater. And heat, right? Sounds like it burned up in the atmosphere, like this thing came from outer space, dude. It's got three holes where something used to be. Some strange cipher is inscribed here. A cipher. Dr. J mentioned a cipher. Him finding this is what led to his kidnapping, so what makes this so important? 
Onward, we have one more dungeon for this chapter. Uh, this is the one that makes all that cool use of the splitting ninja stars. I talked about the tricky hittens earlier, but it really shines with these enemies here, these big uh, tanky guys. Now, they can only fire at you straight on, so by using the ninja stars, you can hit them while standing away at a diagonal. It's not the easiest thing to do, especially since you're moving away so much, you really don't want to get hit by these things, but it is a really cool way to give you an advantage while keeping it challenging, in like a new way, too. We stumble through some more ruins, and oh my god, Look who it is. It's Uncle Steve! We found him! We did it! We saved Dr. Steve. Uncle Steve. Dr. J. We saved Dr. Uncle Steve J. Jones. He tells us how he decoded the cipher from that rock, and it told this amazing story of an alien race called the Argonians. They battled evil aliens and were all but destroyed. But that rock, that was an escape pod. It had the last remaining Argonians inside. It also had these three magic cubes, and the evil aliens want those cubes at all freaking costs. So hey, we saved Dr. Steve, but now it's time for a new mission. Track down the three cubes and hopefully save the Argonian people. One fun little extra tidbit, if you talk to him again, he'll ask if you got the bananas out of your ears. I guess he means like, did you listen? <laughs> did you get the idea across? I don't know what this game's obsession with bananas is. We leave the ruins out of the crater and into chapter seven. Ooh, we're in the final stretch now. This is where we finally board an alien freaking spaceship. And this is one doozy of a dungeon. This is where shit gets real. This is where shit gets tough. This is as hard as this game gets. A lot of tile hopping, a lot of dodging bullets. Oh, these robots are a real pain. Not only do they chase you aggressively and hop tiles, but they fire bullets at you. Some with more range than others, but it usually beats your range. Yeah, let's grab that laser gun. Yeah, you get a laser gun here, isn't that cool as hell? This thing is what you want to rely on for this level. It shoots far and you got lots of it. This level is one giant room. You gotta do a lot of looking around. Long walkways, teleporters that warp you around. It's sort of like a big maze, except without hallways. You'll probably get lost pretty quickly. A lot of this stuff is not really where you need to go, but you can find a lot of stuff that'll help. Some places have weapons, some will give you a mega vitamin that gives you full health and then some. Uh, temporarily at least, it'll tick down until you have full health again, so it's kind of like getting full health and then a temporary shield. You will die here a lot, especially before you really know where to go, but as you become more familiar with the level, you will slowly whittle out a good route, one that picks up everything helpful in the way and wraps around to the bottom, hopefully without getting hit too much. Ah, oh, these jet bike guys, you really have to react quick or you're getting smoked. Just down this way, we get a boss fight with these two bulky jet robots, and you get the long jump power so you're jumping all around and shooting at them with a the laser gun. It is a really fun fight, but man, getting here with enough health to even stand a chance, that is very difficult. Even now, it usually takes me a whole bunch of tries. All oh, those bastard robots, the jet bikes, you want to get that one run where you gather all the weapons and health and potion and you get all the way here with a decent amount of health. So, you know, again, I can see this being very patience testing to a lot of people, but I really love throwing myself at this over and over until I have that route all planned out and you finally land that one run where everything goes well and you finally pull it off. And no matter how many times I beat this thing, it always remains one of the single greatest feelings of triumph I get from any game. And the fact that this game can remain that challenging to me, no matter how old I get, no matter how many times I replay it, no matter how good at it I get, it's like there's a lot of value in that, right? That's what makes me keep coming back to this thing. After battling those bots, we then come out to the overworld where we find the first cube. We grab it, and it upgrades our weapon once again. The shooting star becomes the supernova, the ultimate yo-yo. You want to meet God, son? Well, first, you're going to meet Mike. Because with this thing in your hands, dude, this next dungeon's a total power trip. All this range. Man, we are pummeling all those robot dudes that were just giving us the business. Those pea shooters ain't nothing to me, man. It is still a tough dungeon, though. A lot of hopping between these long stretches, dodging bullets, and robot bats. Well, they're not really robot bats, but they're basically the bat enemies except faster. The, you know, the diagonal movement, they got more health too, and some of them even shoot at you. Not to mention the microwave hall. Do not let those bright hot tiles burn you because it does brutal damage. And again, you gotta carry enough hearts to the boss or you're kinda dicked. So yeah, timing's pretty tricky, but hey, it's nothing I can't pull off after a couple of tries. You really gotta stare at it and learn the pattern. It, it, I remember having a hard time with it when I first played this. And don't get zapped by those zippers either. Zippers? <laughs> I meant like lightning zipping across the 
the screen, but I just said a word that means a different thing. <laughs> and then we're on to the boss. Yeah, I bet you didn't know you fought a freaking Metal Gear in this game. It's totally immune to all damage, but you can push it back, so best to use a laser gun since it's the fastest shooting. Stumble him away and hit the switch, double back to the button, and it's a fight to knock him off the edge. It can be kind of easy if you made it here with a lot of health, but making it here with a lot of health is hard. Good performance is always rewarded with an easier time later. Star Tropics is incredibly good at that. Right after we come out to another maze. And the second cube is ours. This time, it gives us a fully decked out health meter. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. What's going on? What's all that rumbling? What's all that rumbling? We're taking off. What do you mean we're taking off? Soaring through the air, we enter the final chapter. An illusionary image appears before you. You hear an evil voice. <laughs> I am the Prime Invader Zoda. Come on, try and beat me. You'll be defeated like the Argonians will destroy you. <laughs> come on, Mike, come on. Your head is aching. You jam bananas in your ears. You shout, get out of my mind, alien scum. This is freaking awesome, dude. Like, look how cool this looks. The ultimate showdown, the ultimate confrontation, and despite this being the most serious part of the game, it still keeps its stupid ass sense of humor with the bananas. Like, this is freaking awesome, dude. The final dungeon commences, and right away, it's a showdown with Zoda's illusion. A giant head and two floating hands. Classic. Not the hardest fight in the world, just make sure to quickly run away all the way to the end as soon as each hand appears. I love that he shoots his eyeballs at you, and how ridiculous he looks when he does it too. This was actually the very first thing I saw in this game, because the first time I played this, I booted up my dad's completed save file, and this is the last part you can save, so this is where you load in. I remember walking into this and just dying, and, and being really creeped out by that face. God, I remember I accidentally deleted my dad's save file when I started a new game, and he was not happy with that. I didn't know what any of this said. I forget, I couldn't really read that much. I was like four or five. We lay the smack down on the illusion, it explodes, and we move on into the final level. It's a big, long, linear trek, battling through hordes of robots. You can't move out of the way here, so you'll have to be very aggressive, take them out very quickly before they do any damage to you. All you can really do to dodge is jump. It is not an easy final trek, but once you're past it, we get a mini-boss with the ship's core. You gotta stand in the middle here and attack when the bar is open. It'll heal between each closure too, so you gotta keep up the damage, which isn't easy. Every now and then, the tiles you have to stand on open up, and if you're standing on it, you fall down. And if not, a robot pops out and you gotta quickly deal with that. If you fall down through the tile, then you land in a hell robot pit. Don't even try to fight them, just run. Grab the vitamin, grab that laser gun, and get the hell out. These items will always respawn every time you fall down, so if you're not really satisfied with how many hearts you brought into that fight, you can jump down, grab the items, and redo the level with a fresh start. Again, you always want to get there with as much health as possible, so it's pretty cool that they set up like this little loop here you can do to uh, give yourself a fresh run if you need it. And to clarify, it's it's a pretty short level going up to the mini boss, so it's not like you're redoing like a whole bunch of stuff or anything. Take out the core and the ship begins to crumble. We then dodge the squiggly alien parasites on our way up to the final battle. Zoda, in his true form, not the illusion, this is what this alien bastard actually looks like. A monster with razor sharp teeth oozing with spit and slime. This thing is straight out of Alien. Doesn't it look cool as hell? It's a pretty tough fight. He'll hop around and on top of shooting at you, he also pukes up those parasites, giving you a lot of stuff to juggle. Not to mention if he touches you, that's an instant death, so do not get near him. This one usually takes me a couple of tries, which sucks because you have to do the entire dungeon over again for one more chance. Dude, I remember this taking ages back when I played this on Wii. Oh, but man, once you get it, once you land that final blow and you get to see that alien scum writhe and squirm and drool and explode! Oh yeah, now that was a goddamn final boss. One last brief overworld section where we get that final cube and uh, oh, yeah, the, sh the ship's crashing. Yeah, we destroyed the core and now the ship's crashing. Very smart of you to think ahead on that one, Mike. We plummet down into the ocean. Mike tries to swim to shore, but he begins to drown. 
But no worries, we're saved by the dolphins, who bring us back to Sea Island where everybody's waiting to celebrate a job well done. Mike, you rescued Dr. J. That's Radicola. I'm gonna roast a pig for your victory party. Where do you come from, Spacey Cola? Who are you? Stay away from here. <laughs> I'm just kidding you, Mike. Mike, it's me, Babu. Let's celebrate with some cola. You drink it and feel much- No! 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 Stop! Mike, put the cola down! We don't need- There's no game left! We do not need- We don't need this! Inside the chief's hut, Uncle Steve is waiting for us. We put together the three magic cubes and... Oh my god. Whoa. They're transforming. Something is happening. Whoa, it's the Argonians. I'm Princess Mika, daughter of the Argonian leader Hirokon. We seven boys and girls are the last beings from the planet Argonia. She basically describes what like like what Frieza did to the freaking Saiyans, dude. I, I can't believe these kids are alive. Mike, you saved more than just cubes. You saved an entire race from extinction. Dr. J and the Islanders both welcome them to a brand new home here on Sea Island. Okay, tonight's the party. It will be a great feast for all. I'm hungry. Is that a banana cream pie? What is with this game and bananas? Hey, anybody want to go fishing? Let's go! Bit by bit, the camera zooms out. Away from the island. Away from the earth. Out into the stars. Out into the cosmos. And there it is. That is the end of Star Tropics. Now is that a freaking credits transition or what? Now, despite this game only releasing in North America, you'll see nothing but Japanese names here. This was a Japanese game through and through, it was just made for Americans. Hence all the references, the baseball, and things being rad, it was kind of their weird interpretation of what Western audiences wanted from a game at that point. Which is part of the magic, all of the weird, stupid humor throughout it, it is such a beautiful concoction of pure happenstance. And then we get these awesome full-screen sprite paintings of every scene from the game. The dolphins, the graveyard, oh, the ghost! They make this stuff look sick! Why is Mike so busted up looking there? He looks like he's trying to hide the fact that he just puked in his mouth. Oh, the whale, that's really cool looking. And the code? Oh, the parrot! <laughs> and the boulder! Uh, hitting the dodge a little too hard, but he, he looks like he's gonna fly off into the water. No, oh, you bastard robots. They look like the Zaku robots from Gundam. And there's Zoda, spitting aliens! That is rad as hell. This is the stuff that makes the journey worth it, man. And there's Mike, proud of a job well done, followed by, of course, bananas in the ears. And there it is, the very last thing you see after those credits, right there up on my wall. I guess now you know what that's from too. <laughs> uh, my old buddy Steve, I used to work with him, uh, he would tell me that he would do sprite paintings and I immediately asked if I could commission that from him because I, I just felt like it was perfect, you know? It's kind of like looking up at the wall and just seeing the end of that long journey of rediscovery, the, the tale of James and why he loves games. There it all is right there. Once it's all over, you get a pretty fancy Nintendo logo. Pretty nice looking for 8-bit, huh? And in true old game fashion, it just soft locks until you turn the power off. Always hated how old games did that. And that's it. So, what do you think? Pretty wild ride, huh? You could probably see why this game was so mind-blowing to me as a kid, even if I couldn't get very far in it. I mean, from beginning to end, like, this game truly feels like an adventure. From the focus on the dialogue, to the fourth wall breaks, to all the goofy personality carried on by each piece of writing, sprite work, sound, and music, it, it makes no wonder this game left such a lasting impression on me. This was the game that taught me that like, oh wow, yeah, video games, they can be way more than just a fun thing to play. They can be this whole big experience. They can take you through a story, through events and set pieces and give you little moments that matter. That games can tell tales, and those tales only have to take themselves as seriously as they want to. And I still love the gameplay. It is literally one of my favorite controlling and playing games of all time. Yeah, it is not really for everybody, but hey, it sure as hell is for me, and anybody else that likes challenging games where the action is reeled back, and that rewarding nature of improving, carrying more and more hearts later into the level with every attempt, not only giving you a hit point advantage, but also an offensive one as well. Every chapter introduces something new, and the level design will teach you each thing one by one before ramping things up into more challenging and brain-teasing dungeons. Even if things do feel a little cryptic, it's still an arrangement 
management of mechanisms you've been learning at a steady pace. It's not Zelda 1 what do I do cryptic, it's more like poke at it here and there and you will eventually figure it out kind of cryptic. There is some stuff that can be pretty annoying and even a few rare moments that are flat out unfair to anybody playing blind, but it is kind of hard to dwell on that when the game leaves you feeling this freaking satisfied like it was a unique and great game back then and it is still a unique and great game now. I don't really think it's a game that everybody's gonna be able to get into, but that's okay because I strongly believe a lot of games should not be for everybody. So much stuff these days kind of is. So much stuff these days is so standardized. Most popular games from each genre controls fairly similarly at this point because we all now kind of agree what sorts of action should be on what buttons and which things should be stripped out so the player doesn't have to worry about them. But when you do that, you kind of strip yourself of the ability to make something more interesting than what standard. Sure, you might make something that more people can get into, but what about the people that do want to worry about that kind of stuff? Should they only be able to play games where you don't? Of course not. I mean, that's literally what they did to Star Tropics 2. They made it control more traditionally, and guess how many people remember and still care about that one? Nowhere near as many, that's for sure. It may be easier to understand to get into because there's no weird controls to wrap your head around, but you start to realize when you play this one just how much those weird controls were actually adding to the game. How much having to worry about the extra little things can make a game more engaging to some people. Because maybe I prefer when you have to balance a stick and throttle a button to make the grinding go the fastest. Maybe I love it when wall jumps require deliberate angling and precise inputs to pull off. Maybe I want want something as mundane as walking to be something that requires a little bit of thought and effort. Like, I do not care about making my guy do an action. I do not care about watching my character do a thing. I care about that thing offering me a series of mechanisms in which I have to learn and solve in order to get through. And Star Tropics was doing that even back in the day, dude. Like, it was a market full of side-scrollers and space shooters and top-down adventures, and they all controlled pretty similarly. But here was a game that was brave enough to change how even just walking felt. It found a brand new way to control the guy on screen that I, to this very day, find far more interesting than most of that other stuff it all blends together, you know? And guess what happened? Like, people didn't even really react all that well to it at the time, and now even too. But that bravery not to please everybody, that is exactly how you make the stuff that will sincerely stick with some people forever. I guess it's not really a game for everybody, but games don't always have to be. In fact, they shouldn't always be, because in doing so, it ends up being a game for me in every which way possible. I still replay through this entire thing every couple of years, and I probably will until I die. It's always going to remain one of my all-time favorites. From my memories of the mystery surrounding it, to the gameplay that is deeply nuanced and challenging that I do not tire of, to how it's sort of become emblematic of my interest in unconventional controls in games. I wonder if that's why I like tank controls so much. Who knows? Either way, it's still one of the best games on the NES, and it's probably my favorite NES game of all time. Probably always will be, so yeah. Really happy I was able to give it one last thorough playthrough, really show you the whole freaking thing, and really put a ribbon on this guy. I uh, really wanted to do something special for my 10th anniversary, and I felt like this was perfect. So, yeah, thanks for watching. I hope it was a nice stroll through memory lane, and uh, yeah, here's the 10 freaking years of doing Nitro Rad on this channel, and hopefully here's to many, many more. Thanks for watching. Wow, you watched the whole thing, thank you. Uh, I put a lot of work into this one. This was a video I wanted to make for a very long time, so I'm, I'm very happy it got watched. If you enjoyed watching it, uh, don't forget to click the like button, and uh, let me know what you think in the comments too. That stuff always helps these videos perform well. And before you ask, yes, we will be covering Zelda's Revenge again next year.